Two o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. Welcome back to Think Tech. This is our Likeable Science series featuring our chief scientist, Ethan Allen. He's with us here today to discuss the incredible and potentially disruptive phenomenon of artificial intelligence. High tech indeed. Sure, we, we've had AI for some years now. We've talked about it for a long time. But now with bigger, faster computers and huge, big database capacity, AI is coming of age, really coming of age. We can win at Go against international champions. We can run trains and planes and cars. We can analyze things and make important human decisions that we could never, we never thought we could make before with computers alone. Now it's different. We can talk with them in any language and not even know their machines. We can have conversations with them and share our thoughts, even our private thoughts, and get their input. They can be our best advisors and maybe even our best friends. Hal, remember Hal? <laughs> perhaps, just perhaps, we can endow them with the self-awareness you know, feature. We can make them self-aware, just as humans are self-aware, whatever self-awareness may, may really be. We seem to be at a tipping point right now on AI, and this could be uh, the next really big technology to change our lives, our world, and the human condition itself. Let's find out more from Ethan Allen and what's going on in AI these days and how it will take us to the next chapter of human history and development right here on ThinkTech. Welcome back to your show, Ethan. <laughs> Good to be here as always, <laughs> nice Jay. Nice to see you here. <laughs> so what's, what's going on? What is AI? What is AI? How does it work? What was it, how does it differ from all the other computer functions that surround us? Well, so, I mean, the idea of a thinking machine is actually apparently an, an ancient one. Apparently the, the ancient Greeks and all had envisioned this idea of thinking machines, machines that, that could behave like people. Uh, nobody did much about it until maybe the 1600s. They began cranking out the first sort of crude sort of calculation machines. Uh, and it really took off in probably the 1950s. Um, the, the, uh, some folks began getting... Uh, machines that could really do interesting stuff beyond being just sort of big calculators of numbers. And those started, they started to realize potential. Uh, and so for about a decade or so, it actually really took, took off to the extent where they were, the founders of the whole AI field were predicting that within a generation, you know, we'd, be, we'd have machines that were indistinguishable from people and blah, blah, blah. They, of course... Rodman's Universal Robot. <laughs> That's right. Remember that? It was a play in the mm -hmm. 20s, mm -hmm. and it talked about robots taking over the world, mm -hmm. and they were like just like people. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, um, you know, that was a pretty popular mm -hmm. play, mm -hmm. um, and that was way ahead of its time. Right, right. I mean, Frankenstein, you know, again, the, 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 you know, artificial, uh, artificial life form, a machine that had human-like qualities. So it's, it's been talked about and done, but it's been... In a sense, it's sort of like fusion energy, right? The, the, the real ideal of it keeps, keeps being elusive and it keeps staying yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 25 years away. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does seem of late, uh, so many things have happened in the last certainly five years with AI that it, it's really, uh, it seems like, it, it, as you said, it's, it's, it's at a tipping point. It's some, something is very different about the field. And part of it is because now they're... Uh, the folks who in the know, and I, I'm not a computer scientist, so let's be real clear about this, but the folks in the know build machines that you don't have to program the machine explicitly. The machine can look at data and look at more data and look at more data and make up its own programs, basically, based on all the data it's finding and the patterns in the data it's seeing. It figures out stuff. It, it, it makes sense of its world, basically, which is very, very different than what used to happen with machines. Machines were given very specific instructions. They followed them very well, very quickly. They could be very complex instructions, but that's all they did. And now they do other things. They actually think on their own in, in that sense. The, the, you referred to AlphaGo, the, the Go that um, playing computer that beat a world-class champion in March of this year. And AlphaGo initially did not know any Go strategies. All it knew was the basic how to play the game, which is very simple, and what the object of the game is, which is you know, to surround your opponent's pieces. And then it played literally millions and millions and millions of games against itself and gradually figured out the strategies 
so that ultimately it sat down against a world-class player and was able to defeat him four games out of five. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and it probably played those millions and millions of games fairly quickly. I mean, you have to wait, you know, two years for that. Right. <clears throat> and so, you know, that, that suggests that what we have here is a confluence of, um, of, of better metrics. Yes. You know, computers now are faster. Right. Everybody knows, you know, it was a Moore's Law. They get right. faster all the time, right. twice as fast every time you look. Um, that makes them pretty fast. Even cheap computers right. are pretty fast. Then, you know, you have a greater memory, so you can right. do more in memory, and right. memory is really phenomenal, even, even on a household computer. Right. And then you have storage, which is much greater than it was even five years ago. Again, Moore's Law. Right. Um, you know, and, and finally, I guess, I guess we have languages now that are more sophisticated than they used to be. Right. I mean, it's still all based on right. really three things that I can think of. You know, one is the if statement, which is exposed, I mean, expanded to the case statement, mm -hmm. you know, if this, then that, or mm -hmm. case this, then that, case that, then mm -hmm. this. Um, and finally, the ability to, you know, create functions. But I think AI must, I, I'm not a computer scientist mm -hmm. either, but AI must be based on the notion that you can put in data, you can analyze the data, you can make conclusions about the data, and then you can write conclusions down into a database and remember your conclusions. Um, it, it all seems very logical. Well, it's, it's yeah, and it's with access to more and more data uh, in these giant data sets and having access to, to the cloud, computers can not only bring data together, make conclusions from them, but they can use those conclusions to begin making their next algorithms yes. and, and make sophisticated guesses about how, how things should happen or where to look next for more data that, that can reinforce their view or counteract it or whatever. Yes, yes. So, uh, the cloud, I think, is a big part of it because yeah. that expands everything. Right. And, uh, and then, you know, the idea that with the fast speeds uh, and these light, and, lightning fast uh, right. functions, um, you can take all that data, right. analyze it, and then put it in a database and remember it, and right. then go back and get it right. really quick. And the other thing that, that I think is, is being critical here is there's an interface now with better sensor technology. So there's more kinds of sensors available, more sophisticated sensors. They are now working on hands, on, on computers that can grasp things. They finally have figured out how to make computer hands that can feel and feel and do very light touch, and so they can pick up a very delicate objects when they need to, or they can pick up, you know, very sturdy, heavy objects and grip them much more firmly, and they can tell the difference. And they won't crush an egg or a flower when they, but they can pick up a, you know, a steel bar too. It's, it strikes me this is like distributed knowledge. Yes. In other words, that not somebody in a castle in Transylvania is, you know, designing this stuff. Right. It's being de designed all over the world. Exactly. And of course, there are you know engineers and laboratories hither and yon that are ahead of the pack. Right. But the fact is, the pack is not that far behind. Right. Everybody's working on this right. stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are there are, you hear every time you turn around about new apps that you can do. They, they now have apps to work with your home lock system, so you you can with your cell phone you can unlock your door at home to let your friend on in when you're not there, and lock the door behind them. Yeah. Uh, you know. Right. And, and the ability. And, <clears throat> the ability to analyze large amounts of data, including sensor data. It's not just, uh, you know, numbers and, and, and right. text. It's, set, you know, highly technical sensor data. Um, and I'm reminded of that program, Person of Interest, where they can look, at, you know, using cameras, look mm -hmm. at a crowd and identify mm -hmm. your face. That's happening. It's right. all over the world. Sure. And the people actually I had on my show here a, a bit ago from the Smart Yields group here in, in Hawaii, I mean, they were, they're setting up small farms now with huge arrays of sensors, on-the-ground sensors, soil sensors, salinity sensors, temperature sensors, pH sensors, uh, you know, uh, fungal sensors, and, and combined with, with uh, uh, sunlight meters and, uh, you know, wind current sensors, and they combine this now with satellite data, and they have computers that are analyzing all this in real time and controlling how much irrigation, how much fertilizer to put when, where, on the specific Yeah, and parts. don't forget the micro sensors in the biochemistry world. Oh, yeah. No, you know, even the atomic tolerant. world where they can, you know, uh, examine that and make, and make analysis. I mean, is it the, the, the barrier between information technology and biochemistry, um, you know, it's, it's blurred already. Oh, yeah. And one reaches into the other. Yeah can evaluate. I'm actually working on a, just starting to work on a proposal with some folks at University of Washington uh, for a uh, synthetic biology program where they're going to be training students just to sort of cross that boundary, you know, between sort of the, the, the whole 
biochemistry, life sciences, and the chemical engineering, bioengineering side. Uh, so what do I have to have, you know, if I want to be a mad scientist and, <laughs> and do some AI? What do I have to have? I, do I need a room full of Watson computers? Uh, or can I get along with the cloud and, and a relatively, you know, modest uh, home computer? <laughs> I'm, I'm quite frankly not sure. I don't know how much of this stuff is sort of outsourceable now. Uh, what I think you do have to know on uh, is how to use some of the tools that are available now, things like Python, which is a, is a thing that can look at lots of databases at once and help you pull da the data you want and put data from different databases together in meaningful ways. Uh, I have no idea how it works. You know. But you know, one thing comes to mind is that, you know, not that it's easy, but there are a lot of open source programs right. out there. And yes. when I say open source, I mean free programs sure. that are very powerful, more powerful than the, the traditional programs mm -hmm. of 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm a kid at 16 and, you know, I'm inclined to, you know, work in this, um, I can get those programs on my machine instantly. Right. Um, and, you know, it's a parallel, but um, if I want to hack, if I want to be a bad guy and mm -hmm. hack, I can, I can download hacking programs, tools, various sure. tools, also for free from the internet, and I can go do hacking. Well, by the same token, I can probably, I'm guessing, but I can probably hack, or rather, I probably download uh, AI programs that mm -hmm. can, you know, put, uh, you know, put logarithmic I improvements on my open source programs. Mm -hmm. Now I can do remarkable things. Mm -hmm. And if those things are not available right now today, Ethan, soon they will be. <laughs> right, right. You know, I think, so it's all boats are rising. Yes, very much. Very and, much. Um, you know, I think that the people who can develop apps, because the mm -hmm. platform's already there, right. um, the people who can address these problems that are a little more complex than computers have been able to solve before, <clears throat> they can make big money. <clears throat> they can solve problems we, we, we have never assumed we could solve. Now right. we can now let your mind fly, right? Right. right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can, can, they, can they deal with some of the big global issues? Uh, well, that's true. <coughs> you know, I mean, uh, I mean, just think, for example, if, if we can drive trains and cars and mm -hmm. boats and all, all these things, all these things, mm -hmm. and be smart enough for that, why can't we do diplomatic relations? Right. I mean, how complicated is that? <laughs> if you if you put all the information in there right. and you, and you have this self learning capacity, mm -hmm. that's really mind boggling. That the thing can learn Go right. all by itself. Right. Um, and if we can learn diplomatic affairs and languages, right? Languages right. are easy right. for AI. Sure. Um, then we can, you know, we can learn government. Yeah. And uh, just, I'm getting scared now. P well, parts of the, the tr trouble will then be getting people to accept that, you know, and to accept that, that your AI is a neutral party and is going to play fair, basically, uh, right? Yeah. Because uh, the powers that be probably don't wish to go up their power and authority very easily. Uh, well. You know, <clears throat> we've seen that computers have taken over our lives and our society, and that's why hacking is getting to be more of a problem because mm -hmm. it affects, you know, everything we do, really. Right. But if we give it even further license, if we mm -hmm. give it further power, and we say, you know, you can control this part of government or all of government, mm -hmm. you know, Big Brother is watching you, mm -hmm. you know, science fiction come, come true, and now, you know, a little box that big controls the country, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> You know, th that's okay as long as we program, securely program morality into that. You know, and the fundamental, mm -hmm. unchangeable human rights aspect. We right. say never break these rules. Right, right. Like Asimov's okay. three laws of robotics, right? Sh you know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but of course, right. of course, some, some bad guy <laughs> will get in know, and figure out how to override it. from Russia somewhere, <laughs> for example, right. can get into that box and he can change the fundamental rules. Right. Or, override the funnel mill, then all of humanity is at risk. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay? Yes. So let's think about that for one minute and get scared over it, and then we'll take a break and we'll, we'll come right back. Okay. <laughs> Think Tech Hawaii covers stories that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Kaui Lucas. For our show next time, we're doing a Think Tech special, Home Alone and Homeless Alone at Christmas. We want to learn more about the isolated, disconnected people alone in our community. Lots to come on Think Tech. Tune in 10.30 p.m. this Sunday. See you then.
Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Yeah, you scared yet, Ethan? <laughs> you know, we can design a new world. We can design everything. Um, you know, uh, right now, uh, given the last election, you say there's a lot of disaffected people out there. They don't like what happens mm -hmm. to government, and they think it's dysfunctional. And, and you know, they, there's some reason for that. Right. The government can't seem to handle the country in its size and complexity, and other countries the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our old form of government is established by the Constitution is under under threat now because people aren't so happy with it and they don't think it's working. Mm -hmm. Well, I take AI mm -hmm. and I make the whole thing totally rational and mm -hmm. hopefully totally moral. Mm -hmm. You know, I build in the Bill of Rights and all mm -hmm. that, and um, and I make it learn. Mm -hmm. I make it you know exercise judgment and awareness, um, and I make a better country. I mean, why not? Right. I mean, it, it's sort of like the, the uh, gentleman, Hans Kroc, who I had on a while ago with his uh, oceanic thermal uh, energy conversion. It's a system that, if you look at that on, by any rational means, you would say, well, we should all be using this. I mean, this, is, this makes so, such a great sense. It, it's non-polluting, it, it's efficient, it's effective, it produces fresh water as a byproduct, uh, gives you hydrogen for, for fuel if you want it. Out, I mean, sort of, there's, there's no reason in the world not to, not to use it, and, and yet, OTEC really, I mean, is producing, you know, a few megawatts of electricity around the world at this point, and, and not, not very much of that. No, so, it hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah, yeah, but... So if I was a completely rational in governing the, computer, you'd I say would... You, you, you'd have it everywhere, on, you know, a band of OTEC things around, around the, the tropics, basically, in tropical well, oceans, would, yeah. I would ask it the question, right. or it would ask itself it, the question, what do we do with OTEC? Right. And it would say, oh, that's a good idea, we're right. going to do it, that. It begins to suck the car excess carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, cools the ocean, stops them from acidifying. I mean, it has a lot of really good potential to do a lot of good things. We bring but, rationality. Yeah, but yeah. again, how do you get the world to buy into being rational? I mean. All the economists used to believe that people behaved rationally until they saw the evidence that people don't behave rationally. Uh, yeah, that's true. They don't. I mean, you know, in the, in, you know, my theory is the mammalian theory. Everybody is a biochemical combination, mm -hmm. and we are not driven by rationality, right. but it's other things. Right. Well, you know, I think maybe it's one of these things where, like I said, you know, every kid can download stuff to sort of, you know, start doing AI. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a lot of kids downloading a lot of stuff doing mm -hmm. AI, and everybody gets the idea that AI is pretty good. And then you get government agencies. And say, well, we can, you know, distribute, um, uh, uh, you know, delegate part mm -hmm. of our job here to AI. They can make decisions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe even get up to the departmental level and say, well, we don't need the department head anymore. Right. Right. We'll just put the question into the AI machine, and it'll answer. In fact. We let the AI machine decide the question right, and right. answer it that's, itself right. and point. be as smart as it can be. Yeah. Then one day somebody says, you know, we got all the department heads doing that. How about the chief executive? <laughs> How about the legislature? Right. How about the courts? Right. You know, people have long felt that the courts really are just interpreters of data. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we just put the rules in, whatever they are, have the courts decide. Right. And, and then, of course, the time will come when, the, when the, that black box says, well, like, what good are all these people running around? <laughs> like, why should we, like, bother with them? <laughs> why, why should we give them any resources? <laughs> well, that's science fiction. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's sort of a natural right. risk, isn't it? Right. right. And the stakes are really high <laughs> then, because oh. you know it could decide that we're all dispensable. Right. All right. of us. <laughs> One of them might accidentally pull the plug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we propagate a whole nation, a whole world of black boxes instead. <laughs> that's right. They they remanufacture themselves. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. Well, that's, of course, in the whole, this, again, it's this, this coming together of different technologies, the whole nanotechnology self-assembly piece, where they're more and more able to build more and more sophisticated structures at the atomic and molecular level and have these things self-build, huh? yeah. We, we can all be uh, sitting on the couch with the bonbons, <laughs> not have to work while machines are running everything, right, you know? Yes. Uh, it reminds me of this thing about the base income initiatives going on in mm -hmm. Finland and in Sacramento where you just, you pay a given population a couple thousand dollars a month and tell them, you don't have to work, we're just going to take care of you. 
And, and I think, you know, that, that's a very ideal thing to do. And if we had computers doing all the work in the world and mm -hmm. serving us hand and foot, mm -hmm. then everybody could have this, right. you know, base level of income and they could go shopping all day <laughs> and buy computers, I might add. Well, we, we'd have to think about, yes, what, what our purposes be then in life. I mean, people well, do need to be the, driven by purpose, right? That's the issue. And if we don't have to make decisions, if we don't have risks, if it's all just swell out of brave right. new world, right. um, you know, m maybe we lose some humanity in the right. process. Yeah. And that's also scary because yeah. then we become we, vestigial, all of us. Yeah, I mean, we, we've evolved in an atmosphere where threats have been sort of this constant, never-changing thing around us. And, and if, if essentially you sort of take and fulfill all of sort of the levels of Maslow's hierarchy by machines, you know, and, and there are no more threats, yeah, what, what are our brains going to do with that? You know? Yeah, well, I think, you know, technology <coughs> is a, a great tool. But it's also a great risk, mm -hmm. and it uh, depends on how you treat it. I mean, using, for example, hacking technology to hack the elections of other countries, that's really bad stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, falling. And this, yeah. this conceivably, the AI could aid in doing just that in social manipulation, mm -hmm. political manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, AI could be a great assist for that. AI could be used as a weapon of war too, right? Right. And destroy huge populations. Uh, for one, where you could you could create a whole war machine, a, a campaign for war, mm -hmm. using uh, you know we'll turn off the grid here, we'll mm -hmm. manipulate the data there, we'll confuse mm -hmm. the population there. Sure. Um, sure. But, uh, and, and you won't have to fire a shot, but right. it'll, it'll be the end of the people. That, uh, movie Wag the Dog, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, sort yeah. of on a higher level. Yeah, yeah. Well, where you create a whole artificial war going on. And, and yeah. So, I mean, for every kid who's developing yeah. AI, yeah. we need some, somebody else saying, right. wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. My, you know, my AI is better than yours, and plus it doesn't do the nasty right, things. Right. <laughs> it's, it's nice to us. AI that's yeah. nasty wins in right. the end, so you have to have some moral authority that governs all this and, you know, query whether our governmental system, either in this country or outside is equipped to deal with the, the dark side of technology, the well, dark yeah. side of AI coming out. Yeah. No, I mean, we're seeing that, I think, everywhere. We're seeing that in, in biotechnology as well, and, yeah. and yeah. nanotech, and all, all these different areas are, are asking us questions and asking us to decide things that we weren't, we didn't even think about it really a few years ago now. Yeah, yeah and now we have uh, Mr. Putin is saying he's, he's going to scale up the atomic uh, capacity, nuclear capacity, for a war in Russia, and we have Mr. Trump saying he's going to do the same thing here, mm -hmm. and presto digito, we're back in the Cold War, which yeah. reveals the human condition, right. you know, with people not getting along right. and using technology right. as a, a weapon to destroy other people. Right. Um, and nations are walking away from the world court now, uh, which is really disturbing to me because, I mean, if they do that, what's, what's your odds on getting them to agree that yes, let, let, let this black box, rational black box, decide all the right and wrong. You know, that's yeah. Well, <coughs> in terms of you know, so it goes back to a point you made a little while ago, and that is, <clears throat> how do you get people to agree that AI to to you know re replace ex existing right. um, decision making structures right. with AI? Right. How how are you going to get incentives? them to agree? Because right. they have to concede their own authority right. that way. And yeah, people will happily do that in some cases, right? When when they when you know there ha hasn't been a lot of pushback against Roomba, right? The little robot that goes around and vacuums, right? Because nobody wants to vacuum. No problem. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone will give up their right to vacuum. Yeah. You know, and they'll give up when when it, there's an incentive, when it gives you more free time, more leisure time, saves you expense, energy, whatever. You know, people yeah. will. But how about laying the the the, uh, the, right. the, uh, the track of a pipeline that's carrying oil? Right. <clears throat> that's you know controversial. Right. How about placing mm, telescopes on mountains? Right. Exactly where do you yeah. place them? Yeah. There's all these you know non-specific considerations right. and cultural psychology. Right. But again, this is just what AI is pressing into now is being able to to work in these messy situations where it, where you can't. Have, it's not absolutes. It's not yeses and nos. It's not ones and zeros. It's you know, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of factors. You have to look at a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, and, 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 and assuming that it's presented correctly to the public who might otherwise argue about it, who will otherwise <laughs> argue about it, if it's presented correctly and it has credibility, then it is what we ought to focus on. In other words, don't worry about it, you know, ruining the world. Mm -hmm. Let's just ask it 
in a relatively simple questions that might otherwise be controversial and feed it all the data we can possibly feed and let it turn around and come up with recommendations um, that are, you know, well thought out right. and conceivably, you yeah. know, credible and believable. Well, again, I mean, it's, it's somewhat like the, the people who, who say, you know, no, no uh, genetically modified organism should be allowed. I mean, sorry, but that technology is out of, you know, it's out of the box. It's a Pandora. It's been let loose. You know, it's going to cause, it's going to go. So we might as well regulate it as best we can, make use of it as best we can, and, and proceed along with it. And same with AI. I mean, it, it's here to stay. We can't, we can't push it back into the box anymore and say, we're not going to have smart machines. You know, smart no, machines are here. They're, we don't do it somebody else. Yeah, every, everyone knows how to make them now. So yeah, um, uh, all we can do is try to, again, use it as sensibly and rationally as we, as we can. And, and well, for the, so it's doing as much good for as many people and as little harm to as few people as possible. Yeah. You know? Just hope it, that it, it isn't, you know, converted, and it might be, it might even be now converting to uh, weapons of war. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather, uh, you know, go, go to an AI box and say, um, what should be the rules about, uh, about GMOs? Mm -hmm. what, you know, what, what legislation do you recommend right. about GMOs? Right. Um, how are we going to solve the, you know, the problem of pesticides? Right. And you tell it everything you know, right. and it's not that much. We don't know that much. And uh, given right. the biochemistry, right. you give them the social, right. you know, all the protests. You have it. Right. In fact, you have testimonies. Right. People come and right. they talk in they front testify. of the box. Right. And, and they can do it all around the world at once. Everybody. So you get a lot of data them. feeding in really fast. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Examine the whole right. problem, yeah. everything. And the machine's probably come and come up again and say, give me more data. Give me more information. <laughs> 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 but, but maybe, but well, but you build in something where it says, you know, you, you have to do this within a certain amount of right. time. Right. And you can't break these rules or that rules. Um, just a minute. You can't right. break these rules or, that, or those rules, and you, you know you have to satisfy these considerations. Right. And and I mean I can see this going up the chain of authority and maybe coming up with recommendations that would really right. be valuable to us. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I mean I think AI has that potential to be a, a very useful adjunct to decision making. You know the question is it's still ultimately at least for some while going to be a human decision. You know, you can get the recommendations. Your AI looks and says, "Hey, I've examined all the data around the world, and here's what I think we ought to do about global warming, yeah. you know, or climate change, or whatever." Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and maybe it's run, run away as fast as we can. Yeah, you know? right. Maybe it's stick your head in our sands and ignore it. I don't know, but uh, you know. right, whatever, whatever it says. Right. But over time, we may develop an experience factor. Uh, that where these things actually making good recommendations, right. and then we ultimately consider the possibility of putting them in charge. Right. There's, there's a risk to do that, right. but that may be in the offing if they work in the first analysis. Right. So, for instance, if self-driving cars become relatively common, right, people will get to trust self-driving cars if they're if there are more of them, they see more of them on the road, the accident rates go down, more yeah. people start yeah. using them, yeah. the accident rates continue to drop, more yeah. the legislation gets written to encourage self-driving cars, blah, 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 and they'll gradually, and then we will have conceded our authority over driving to some extent, and we'll be more comfortable with that level of artificial intelligence having that power. Yeah, That's, that it's like a think tank yeah. thing. Right, right. You know, black box, think tank, and you put the question in, and you have it right. come up, all the data it asks for, and right. you come up with an answer, and then... And then you, I bet you find some good decisions. Right. And to some extent, as you say, because it's, it's, it's not centered in one thing. We talk about the black box, but it's really a million black boxes right. you know, who, 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 are, who are chatting with one another. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it gains some resilience against hacking that, in that way, right? Because you've got these aut autonomous units, just like every self-driving car is sort of watching out for itself, right? And you yeah. teach it to resist bad influences. <laughs> right, right. You teach it to resist hacking. Right. Yeah. You know, ideally. Yeah. So we're out of time, Ian, uh, Ethan, but uh, let, me, let me ask you to turn to camera uh, one <laughs> and tell the people, including those kids out there who might be interested, um, this is Ethan Allen, our chief scientist, giving you his uh, summary and advice of what to do about how to think about AI. Go for it, Ethan. Uh, it's sort of like uh, thinking about science. You want to be skeptical. You want to be curious. You want to be open-minded, and you want to make evidence-based decisions. There we go. There it is. <laughs> I think we really covered some ground. All right. Isn't science great? Yes, indeed. Likeable, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>